Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are navigating the journey. And today, what a journey it is. My goodness, we are going to take a look at Mauna Kea, the mountain in question that has been all over the world. People have all kinds of ideas and suggestions, and who knows what. So, I have asked a dear, dear friend who is a cultural icon who I have known for, never mind, we, we won't go there. But every time I need something about the Hawaiian language, about the Hawaiian people, about the Hawaiian culture, this is the go to. And this is my dear friend, Peter Apo. <laughs> Hi, and, Marshall. And Cultural you, icon, it, it sounds like I should be stuck up on a wall or something. You know? <laughs> Let, let's, <laughs> we're too old for that. <laughs> <laughs> but and, thank you for inviting me to, to And, and you know, if you story. read his resume, it's, it's about that long. We take up the whole show talking about his resume. Well, I'm not really that much of an expert, but I do know who to, who to call. Oh, yes. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and I know we build this show about tourism and when is tourism too much. And because you are so much a part of the tourism and the beginning, middle, and end, and whatever. However, Mauna Kea has sucked all of the oxygen out of every other topic. So it here we are. Certainly has <laughs> done that, that, yes. So, first of all, tell us, where is Mauna Kea? Well, Mauna Kea is on the island that we refer to as the Big Island. Uh, probably better uh, not to upset people, uh, it's Hawaii Island. Yes. Yeah, uh, which is at the southern, southern uh, tip of the Hawaiian Island. And it is an island still evolving. It's still got active volcanoes, etc. And I've always loved the Big Island. It's, uh, it has a primeval sense. Like, you walk through those forests and you expect to see a dinosaur <laughs> come out from behind one of those trees, you know? <laughs> and it is at South Point, the most southern point in the United States. Yes. Yes. So, yes. Still yeah. evolving. Still evolving. Right. So tell us now, so Mauna Kea is one of the many mountains on the Big Island. Is there a volcano under that one? Well, there was a volcano under that one. I, I'm not really sure as to its status, but I'm assuming that it's enormous. Well, yeah, uh, let's hope so. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole lot of activity <laughs> going yeah, on there, so I hope it's enormous. Yes. Or we're all in trouble. So this, why is it that that was selected for a teles or all of those telescopes that are up there. Well, it's first of all, it's at fourteen thousand feet. I believe it's uh, it, if I believe if measured from the bottom of the sea, it is the tallest mountain in the world. Uh, measured from the from the from the uh, top of the of the ocean, there uh, I think it's either the second or third largest mountain. One, so the height. And uh, the degree to which it penetrates the sky, you know, is important. But also, the sky above it uh, apparently is, is really clear, so the telescopes can penetrate, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the view going way back without without any fuzziness. So it's an ideal spot for a, in fact, the ideal spot in the world for a locating a telescope. Um, it seems to me, and not being Hawaiian, but it seems to me that the Hawaiians have uh, sailed around the world navigating with the stars. And so the telescope, to me, seems a, an extension of that view, an extension of what they already know. Absolutely. Yeah. Let, let me frame, frame the, the, the issue. At least one... Uh, 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 one of the larger perspectives, you know, on the issue, the um, when the university, the, the, first of all, the, the the mountain has been held with great reverence, you know, over the years, and so the degree to which uh, the the um, 
sacredness is invoked on the mountain sometimes comes into question, is the entire mountain sacred? Is every square foot of it sacred? Uh, what is the history of the, of the Hawaiians' use of that mountain? You know, what, what has been down through the centuries, the practices that occurred on the mountain? All of these things are, are now brought into question as a, a group of Hawaiians, a large, a large group, uh, is objecting to the expansion of the, the telescope uh, platform. Uh, and th there's, I think, 13, uh, no, eight telescopes. I can't remember how many. Now. But it's a large footprint. It is. The latest telescope, uh, which is uh, measured at 18 stories, is, has really drawn a lot of fire from many Hawaiians who are claiming, uh, making sacred claims uh, on the mountain and as a, uh, as, an, as, a, as a huge cultural injury. And it's stirring up uh, a lot of, they're stirring up uh, a lot of uh, controversy uh, throughout. And as you know, there are demonstrations going on that are preventing people who work on the other telescopes and other projects on the mountain from getting to work. So it's become, uh, you know, a huge flashpoint in Hawaii. So let's get to the, the question of the cultural claims. There, there are a number of claims, but the one that I, first of all, I support uh, the notion of this 30-meter telescope, the one that's in question. Right. And um, I, I, I support it. The, the objection to the, to, the, to the telescope is that it is, it is a cultural injury. And the claim that, that, that I, as I understand it, is that the entire mountain is sacred and that the air column above the mountain is also sacred. And any penetration into the mountain or penetration of the air column above, above it constitutes a cultural injury. Uh, and that, that's, that's what they're saying. That's kind of a blanket. A blanket. Okay. Now, now there, there are other uh, cultural complaints uh, regarding uh, other activity on, uh, on the mountain, but, but that's the base overline. Well, first of all, the, that blanket claim flies in the face of the actual history of the mountain. Uh, if, if you look down to the record, and there was a period where I, I actually had contracted several uh, scholars uh, on, the issue, uh, on these issues uh, and came out with a white paper on it. And the, the claim that the entire mountain is sacred is, is cannot be validated. There are three ways you validate a cultural claim generally. One is through archaeology. A uh, second is through um, <clears throat> chants and um, uh, oral, oral, uh, oral traditions uh, that, that are preserved through time. And, and third, by uh, uh, scholars uh, that do studies uh, mm -hmm. like that. And there is a fourth way, and that is the, the activity or whatever the tradition uh, that is being claimed on the sacred place has to occur, or the activity has to occur over a period of time and in repetition. You've got to show it. It's not just something that started yesterday and all of a sudden. All right, so, you know, as you brought up earlier, the, the Hawaiians had a great preoccupation with the stars. But even more than that, the most sacred thing about Hawaiian culture was the search for knowledge. Right. The search for knowledge, uh, discovery, uh, Hawaiians are on record and have a tremendous record down through the centuries of how well they've been able to manage natural resources, uh, that knowledge was the basis of quality of life. And when you look at some of the things that they've done, uh, one of them being navigation and using the stars uh, to navigate thousands of miles of ocean without compass, without sextant, is a testimony uh, to, to that kind of a uh, yeah, uh, it's knowledge incredible. Based directing. It? Things like uh, these gigantic fish ponds uh, in, in managing uh, a food supply on the, on the shoreline, where they understood the concept of photosynthesis. All of this centuries before the uh, Europeans even got to, uh, or anybody else got yes. to the uh, Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. So search for knowledge uh, trumped everything. So the, these claims that are being made, and especially with the opportunity that the, that the TMT, the 30-meter telescope, is presenting, 
not just to Hawaii, but it would seem to Hawaiians to become a leader in, in global astronomy uh, seems something that is so natural you know, to, the, uh, uh, to the culture and so consistent with the history of the culture and, and the, uh, how Hawaiians have behaved in the relationship with the Earth. Uh, it seems like a no-brainer. Well, now, of course, like I said, I see it as an extension of what the knowledge they already have, that this takes it to the next level. And also, since I'm a mother and a grandmother and a great-grandmother, and my sons all went to high school here, college in California, and they're still in California. You know? Yes. So I see this learning that we have this new knowledge is a way for our students, our people to stay here, to gain all of this new horizon in, in things that, that we, who knows what, what we're gonna learn. Well, yeah, the, 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 the opportunity that, that, that uh, in the world of science, uh, astronomy based presents to Hawaii in having Hawaii take its place as a global leader yes. in this incredible uh, growth industry. I mean, the opportunity, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, and so e even, mo I think more, uh, uh, more important is Hawaiians should be at the forefront of this search for knowledge. We should be at the forefront of wanting to locate or to create the center of gravity for global astronomy here on island as something to be proud of. And one of the cultural consistencies that the telescope, in terms of an opportunity the telescope presents, is it was in, it's important in cultural history, in, in the Hawaiian culture, to search for the ancestors. That is, the Hawaiian story of creation goes back to what is referred to in the chant as the night of full, full darkness. They're talking about going back to the beginning of time to seek our ancestors. That is about as sacred uh, uh, a cultural concept as, as you can get. That's what this telescope will do that will allow us to do that no other telescope so far uh, can boast, that it will help Hawaiians actually travel through time back to the beginning or pretty close to the beginning. So with those two things uh, as considerations, I, it just, it hurts me and it puzzles me that Hawaiians would object uh, to uh, moving forward, you know, and uh, uh, taking our lead in, uh, in humanity for something that is such a stellar, uh, a great, great uh, way forward. Well, now, this has been in the works for, what, 10, 15 yes. years? And all the way to the Supreme Court? Yes. And the court said it's okay to build. And now, what happened that all of a sudden, Something else. What what happened? Well, this or do do most people know that it went to the Supreme Court? I don't think. Well, it, yeah, it, it was ten years in the making and, and and been through every kind of examination and, and government uh, vetting that you could possibly go, which includes a very expensive, long, you know, several years of legal battles, and they have emerged uh, with approvals to go. Um, so that's another issue. Um, the uh, the occupation uh, of of the mountain by the the protectors, you know, and and again, I've nothing. I don't mean to insult anyone. Uh, the protectors they have a belief system. I don't agree with the belief system, but they've pretty much brought all activity on the mountain to a, to a stop. So this raises the issue of um, of the rule of law. Uh, that construction on the telescope, even though it's been approved by the Supreme Court, cannot start because they won't allow the, uh, the, the construction workers or the truck to go up. They just recently, after shutting down even the other telescopes that are already there, people from going and, and going to work. So now you have a question, in my opinion, of a separation of church and state. You know, how is it that religious claim of sacredness and Trump a person's right to access public land. And, and one of the things that I think is really egregious is that the state has put itself in a, in a position where it actually seems to think it has to ask permission 
from the protectors. I mean, that's what the optic. It, it is. It is. Well, listen. Has permission to access state lands. That I think that's something weird about that. It is. Yeah. Yes. Listen, we need to take a break, and when we come back, let's keep going. Let's okay. see where this takes us. All right. Okay. We'll be back in sixty seconds. Aloha, I'm Keisha King, host of At the Crossroads, where we have conversations that are real and relevant. We have spoken with community leaders from right here locally in Hawaii and all around the world. Won't you join us on thinktechhawaii.com or on YouTube on the Think Tech Hawaii channel? Our conversations are real, relevant, and lots of fun. I'll see you at the crossroads. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Winston Welch, host of Out and About. It's a show that we have every other Monday on Think Tech Live here. We explore a variety of topics that are really interesting. We explore organizations, events, and the people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. We've got some amazing guests on here, like all the shows at Think Tech. So if you want to catch up on stuff, Tune into my show every other Monday and other shows here on Think Tech Live. It's a great place to learn about stuff, to be informed, and uh, if you have some ideas, come on my show. Let's talk about it. See you later, and aloha. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are back. We are navigating a journey that takes us all the way back to the beginning of time. The night of Poe. The night of Poe. I like that. I like that. My guest is Peter Apo, a cultural icon. And uh, I went to work at the original Satellite City Hall, and Peter Apo's mother, Margaret, was there. She was the icon. Uh, she was the icon. I'm the son of the icon. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, so tell us. Uh, about yeah, so excuse me. the there are two sides to every story. Yes. So we've talked about the, uh, uh, the search for knowledge, how the, uh, Hawaiians ought to be supporting uh, the telescope, et cetera. Now, while I don't agree with the methods that are being used uh, in terms of, of how the issue is being fought, I will say this uh, about some of the claims that the state has made. I believe the state and the University of Hawaii could have done a much, much oh, better they should have. job yes. over the 10 years that this has been an issue. Uh, for instance, we know that the, the footprint of, of the, the telescopes that are out there has been growing and growing, and, and so it, this is not new news that it was growing to a point where they were going to get some protests. Two of the telescopes, as I understand it, are, are uh, now obsolete. You, th you would think that they would have, to stave off some of the complaints that they've been hearing over the years, they would have come forward. If there is a plan, I don't know, a decommission plan. What is the plan to decom decommission? Because telescopes go obsolete as the technology Increase, yeah. increases. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if one has been offered, I'm, I'm not aware of it. I don't know that. Uh, I haven't heard anybody really talk about it other than there was some expression of intent from the university who, uh, uh, who has the, the lease on that mm -hmm. part of the, uh, that they were concerned about it. So where's, I think it would be a great start if a decommissioning plan of existing telescopes as they go out uh, were, were to happen, one. And then um, secondly, there are other activities on, on the mountain because the the claims to sacredness, uh, while they're centered on the TMT, it also includes other kinds of activity, tourist activity that goes on on the mountain, other uses. And so the, the overall management of the mountain, I think, has come under question as to whether, uh, in the name of one, the Hawaiians being able to access certain areas of the mountain to, to practice uh, their cultural, you know, yes. relig religious practices, and how the mountain is used for other purposes, I think, uh, sort of begs to, to be better managed. So that's an issue that, I, I, that is part of the, the overall dialogue. So it's kind of looking at a Is that being, is that, because we don't hear that. 
Are they, are someone, OHA, anybody looking at management? Well, it's a problem because there's no communication. There's no public communication coming from those who manage the mountain on these issues. It's not, not that I've seen, I don't, no one calls a press conference. You know, generally you'll have a, a, a I think the university has a spokesman that they use who, who once in a while will come out. But there's been, as far as I'm concerned, you know, no real, uh, uh, attempt to regularly communicate with the public on what, what the status yes. of the mountain is, other than, you know, reading the newspaper, watching television, and seeing what reporters have to <laughs> say about the latest confrontation. And, the, and most reporters have no sense of history. Right. But they're all young. They don't yes. know. Yeah. They so, don't know. Uh, and uh, it is really sad for me that we don't know more, that our media doesn't tell us the history. And, or if there is, I guess the, the university, because they have classes geared to the telescope, yes. why they're not out front and telling us the whole, just like you told yes. us the story. Yes. Where are they? Yeah. Where and is OHA? Aren't they part of managing the land? Yeah, well, as I, as I understand it, uh, I was with OHA for eight years, and, and I've been gone now, I didn't run you know, yeah. again last session, but. As I understand it, OHA's position is really directed more towards the total management of the mountain, although I, uh, in terms of any official vote that they've taken, I believe that the majority of the trustees probably do uh, support the protectors and uh, with respect specifically to TNT. But that has not been a decision uh, that was made uh, uh, by a formal vote of the trustees. Well, I'm, I mean, that's fine to protect support the protectors. Yeah, that, that's not an issue. My issue is where are they to tell the story, so the rest of us know the story, yeah. just like you did, to say, well, who is the manager of the land? Is there a manager of the land? So that you say, this is where their practice is. And like you're saying, now we are at a yes. there is, church there is and state a, here. We have an issue here. There's a formal uh, state entity that, that is responsible for, for the land. It's called the Office of Mauna Kea Management. Well, where uh, are they? State operated, and it's it's a group. It's a uh, relatively inclusive uh, a group of people. Uh, I don't know uh, whether I don't know what kind of authority they have to speak on behalf of the state on an issue like this. Uh, whether you know they have to take direction. But we, they haven't said a school. word. We didn't know it, that they existed. They, yeah, so that's part of my, uh, my complaint, and I'm not faulting them directly, but at, uh, the buck stops with the governor's office, right. basically. So oh, my. There needs to be a lot more information <laughs> no. uh, coming out, you know, <laughs> of that. So, yes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so the overall management of the mountain under this office of, of monarchy management, we they, just need they, to hear. They dropped the ball. Yeah. One thing that, again, probably my biggest concern moving forward on not just on Mauna Kea, but any cultural claim that will affect public policy or has the, um, has the potential for, for stirring up some controversy is that when in ancient times, when you had a, a, a cultural practices, they were governed by the priesthood. There was a priesthood that was able to, to rule uh, on things. And then if, if, if claims were being made, there was a way to adjudicate it, you know, to vet, mm -hmm. and to establish whether a claim was legitimate and could be proven by the three, uh, the three methods that I mentioned earlier, right. anthropology, et cetera. Yes. Well, th there is no center of gravity on that now. Um, for all the scholars that we have around, um, there's no real formal body that, that is either assigned a responsibility either by the state or perhaps the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. I tried to get OHA to actually establish a process, a procedure by which whenever there was a controversy like this, that they, we would have a, uh, uh, some kind of a, uh, an organization or a group of, of people that would weigh in 
through research and through checking out uh, history and to tell us whether a cultural claim is legitimate or not. That is absent here, almost totally absent. It is. I mean, at least I haven't seen it. I haven't heard. I didn't read it in the paper or anything. Yes. So, so you know, like, like I've evidenced, I've, I've noticed that um, uh, the protectors on a couple of occasions, uh, if I, the news reports, if I got that right, have created new, uh, what we call an ahu. It's basically a, a, a small stone, uh, right. stone enclave, a, a platform, and then declared the area sacred. So something that wasn't there yesterday all, all, all of a sudden appears today and becomes sacred. So, I, you know, how does that, is that, is that a practice that, that, that we need to honor? Uh, I, I doubt it, but, you know, I, again, in the absence of the priesthood or any, uh, uh, any governmental body that is able to weigh in, I think it's critical moving forward because Mauna Kea is only one, as we move forward, uh, I think one cultural issue uh, that is, you know, it's a warning signal that moving forward, uh, we need to be prepared to deal with other cultural issues that I'm sure is going to arise uh, as the, especially the younger people are getting yes. very, very strident about culture. Uh, and, and in my opinion, a, a little bit lack on doing their homework and really understanding. You know, well, but it seems to me as big as Mauna Kea is, that there's room for both. There is totally room for for sharing. The mountain does need to be shared. I think it has to be carefully shared, but mm -hmm. certainly uh, it has a, a lot of ways to bless us all, you know, right. in terms of its position, now, opportunity. There's one, one, before we go, there's one thing that I did hear just yesterday, and that is a tour company had to lay off people because they cannot take people up to the mountain. What about tourism in the mountain? Got to be careful. I think I think if tourism is is carefully monitored, I I don't see any reason why we should not, sh uh, you know, take care of the mountain. Uh, so I I know there's there there might be some uh, some objection to it, but tourism in general, which, which I hope we'll have a chance. We to, you got to come back. To, we'll talk uh, about that. Yes. Yeah, we'll talk about tourism, but uh, it's a good question about letting tourists access you know, something that other people consider sacred. I personally think it should be fine. But there's more stuff going on with tourism. I mean, uh, basically, oh, yes. we've pretty much reached capacity, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. In my opinion. Well, we need to, uh, gosh, I hate to let you go. So <laughs> what we'll do is part two. <laughs> okay. So when we can talk about tourism, because it, it's, Especially when you look at Port Lanaka and it's just overrun, yes. just overrun. But Peter, thank you so much. You. It's always a pleasure to spend time with you. And we will come back and we will do part two. Great. Is tourism too much? Thank you, Martha. Thank you so much. Aloha.